one state that we live in what is called the era of the nuns. Let me explain that. That according to recent surveys, some 23% of the American population, which amounts to over 55 million individuals, in surveys taken about religious affiliation, check none. And so over 55 million people in this country say they have no religious affiliation. And those numbers seem to be growing in recent years. And so as a result, some have labeled this a post-Christian society. And perhaps the sobering thing about it is the people that are checking none on religious surveys about religious affiliation are people who have had an affiliation previously. And so many of these are people who have had a connection with the church and have been exposed to the Bible. In fact, they might be a, a line of many generations who've been church people that are simply choosing to opt out of it today. And so again, they may have been in the habit of going to church, they may be familiar with the Bible, but they are consciously making the decision saying, the Bible doesn't have any great relevance for my life today. And so they're looking elsewhere for life guides rather than the Bible. And again, these are people who are not unfamiliar with the Bible, people who know the Bible, but are in a sense checking out. And that's rather sobering. That's the culture that we're up against as we take a stand for the Word of God and the morals and principles of Scripture. We're taking a stand in a day and age when increasing numbers are saying, what you're about is not what I'm about. And so we are rapidly becoming a minority in our society today. I'm not discouraged by those things, however. While there is a, a whole generation now that's checking out from the authority of Scripture, there is something that appeals potentially to that generation that's checking out, and that is the appeal of lifestyle. The one thing that is very hard to deny is people who live a radically different lifestyle, and why do they do so? And so a generation that may question the authority of the Bible and the standard of the Bible, but may take a good look at our lives and wonder why it is that we live as we do. And of course, that gives us a wonderful opportunity to say the Bible does matter and the principles concerning Scripture make a difference in my life and they can make a difference in your life as well. And so, again, a generation that's becoming rather skeptical of the thus saith the Lord and the Bible says, find it rather intriguing to think about the people of faith on the pages of Scripture. People like Abraham. Why would a man like Abraham exhibit the kind of faith that he exhibited? And how about the apostles? Why would the apostles live and die martyrs' death for the cause of Christ? What's behind all of that? And why would the early church believers live in the radical way they lived as a community and as individual believers? And how were they able to have such a great impact upon the world of their day? Again, those who were checking out of church and maybe even the authority of Scripture are yet drawn back as they see lifestyle that makes a difference. The issue of character and lifestyle is always important, but it is probably never more important than it is at this particular time that we live in. And so as we take a look today into Titus chapter 2, which is largely about character and lifestyle, I think we look at it with new eyes considering that these things that we take to heart and try to practice in our lives appeal to a generation that may be dismissing the Bible in itself. We may be drawing them back in by living according to the standards of what the Apostle Paul says here to a young man named Timothy. So, Titus chapter 2, verse 1. The Apostle Paul writes to Titus and says, But as for you, speak the things which are fitting for sound doctrine. I like the God's Word translation and how it renders this verse. Tell believers to live the kind of life that goes along with accurate teachings. That's the appeal to each one of us. Live the kind of life that goes along with accurate teachings. If the Bible sets forth a variety of teachings that are truths, then the appeal is live a life that is consistent with those teachings. 
Again, about 23% of our American population is skeptical of the authority and the relevance of the Bible. But as we think about living a life consistent with the sound teachings of the Bible, we just might draw them back and say it does matter. It makes a difference in my life. It can make a difference in your life as well. So Titus launches into some lifestyle character guidelines for older men in verse 2. I think about older men, I guess I would have to identify with older men at this point in my life. I still love, live under the uh, delusion that I'm in my 30s. But I really am about twice that. So, uh, and I guess back in those days when you didn't live as long, life expectancy wasn't I'm probably a really old man by those standards. So this really applies to me, but uh, to all the rest of the old men in this room, verse 2, he says, Older men are to be temperate, dignified, sensible, sound in faith, in love, and in perseverance. In essence, the summary of that verse is, Older men lead by example. Live a life of moral character and integrity and by the wisdom of your years, you're able to lead others simply by the example of your life. And that's what leadership really is anyway. So much is said and written about leadership. But leadership is by example. Model leadership. Model certain characters. Model certain moral integrity. An example of that is I think of a friend of mine who's in the ministry. And he told me that years ago before his conversion, talking about his years of living a pretty worldly lifestyle... He said one thing that made a real difference in his life while he was a long way away from the Lord was he thought about the older men in the church that he attended whenever it was that he attended, which wasn't that much. But he said he thought about the men in the church. And he said they lived their lives in such a way he knew that if the truth of his life was found out, he would not want to disappoint them. And so without them saying a word to him, by the way they lived their lives, that appealed to him and basically said, I want to be like those men. And that was instrumental in his conversion. And so a great example of how that works. Older men, as we live according to, to what Paul says to Titus here, we have that opportunity to appeal to younger men that they might walk in obedience to the Lord. Again, to a skeptical generation today, by the integrity of our lives, we may very well appeal to them. So older men are challenged, to summarize what Paul says here, challenged to live clear-headed, purpose-driven lives, disciplined in thought and in decision-making, grounded in faith, grounded in love, and bravely and steadfastly bearing the trials and afflictions of life, staying the course with integrity. Verses 3 to 5. He talks about the character and lifestyle of older women and also younger women. He says, older women likewise are to be reverent in their behavior, not malicious gossips, not enslaved to much wine, teaching what is good, so that they may encourage the young women to love their husbands, to love their children, to be sensible, pure, workers at home, kind, being subject to their husbands, so that the word of God will not be dishonored. Key thought in those verses is that mentoring is clearly in focus. Older women, live your lives in such a way that you can mentor the younger women, especially the newlywed women. And so be an example to the younger women and indeed to all people. Again, very consistent with what was said to older men. Be an example and mentor others by your example. I was thinking about something that my brother-in-law said this summer at our general conference. In his farewell message as chairman of the board of directors, he talked about the women whose lifestyle had influenced him and impacted him. And it was pretty touching because I know he spoke from the heart. And many of the women that he spoke about were pastor's wives. And uh, one of those pastor's wives was, was my wife. And uh, I'm a little bit biased there. I'm sure I'm not terribly objective. But I think she exemplifies the qualities that uh, Paul is talking about here. But again, another example of, of moral leadership. Again, these were women who had impacted his life and set a godly example for him. And indeed, there's so many women in Scripture. You know, women are the unsung heroes in Scripture, I think, so very often. But there are so many outstanding examples of great women in the Bible. Thinking about a few of them, namely Abraham's wife, Sarah. Great person of faith. Person of great character. We think about Ruth, who seems to have been a very humble woman. 
but certainly blessed of God. And Esther, who was raised up, as Scripture says, for such a time as this. And she literally spared uh, millions from being killed because of her leadership and example. Deborah, a, a judge during the times of Israel, and uh, many, many other great women of faith and character who exemplify exactly what Paul is talking to Timothy about here. Again, the example of these older women is supposed to appeal to younger women so that the younger women would learn to love their husbands and their children, that they would live sexually pure lives, that they would work productively, that they would be subject to their husband's headship, a concept not terribly popular in this day and age, but a timeless principle in Scripture nevertheless. All that is written here concerning older women and younger women is for one great purpose. And I think this great purpose applies to older men, younger men, older women, younger women, whatever the case. Note that the purpose at the end of verse 5 is that the Word of God will not be dishonored. Why live a life of character, of moral integrity, so that God's Word will not be dishonored? You know, I have to wonder... In this day and age when over 55 million people are saying they are nuns concerning religious affiliation, I wonder if those decisions are at least partially made because of the discrepancy between professing faith and lifestyle of both men and women. Have they seen hypocrisy and said it must not matter because people that we see are not living according to those standards? May that never be said of us. And again, we strive to live according to these standards listed here. Verse 6, likewise, urge the young men to be sensible. Not very much said to the young men, just one simple thing. They are to live sensible lives. To live sensibly means to be self-controlled. It means to be morally responsible. And what a great challenge. Think about the challenge for young men to live in a moral way. And that has to be the greatest challenge that a young man faces. Think that more and more I'm becoming aware of the modern challenges to moral integrity for young men with today's technology, the internet in particular. I know growing up as a young man, I faced plenty of temptations and moral challenges myself. But that was before the age of the internet. That was before the age of those things that are so tempting and enticing today. It is incredibly difficult for a young man to live with moral integrity. And so I think that young men are especially vulnerable to the enticements of things such as the Internet. It is a great battle. It is a battle that requires honest and open accountability with other men if that battle is to be won. So what Paul writes here to young men is certainly urgent and important for this day and age as well. As Paul writes to Titus, he's writing to him as a young man as well because he includes him in verses 7 and 8. As he says, young men are to be sensible in all things. Show yourself, he says to Titus, to be an example of good deeds with purity and doctrine, dignified, sound in speech, which is beyond reproach, so that the opponent will be put to shame having nothing bad to say about us. In essence, what Paul says to Titus is make sure that your conduct confirms to your teaching. So probably Titus was a preacher or a teacher. And so make sure that you live in such a way that you do not negate what it is that you teach and preach. Boy, that sure speaks to me as a pastor. As an older one now, but when I was younger as well. Uh, a real challenge to make sure that I would live my life consistent with that which I stood before the people of God to preach and to teach. Years ago, as a young man, as a rookie pastor, I remember well, an honest church member came up to me and said something to the effect, you preach high and lofty things, but I really wonder if you are living according to what you preach and teach. It was not an outright accusation, but I talked about high ideals. I talked about the great ideals of Scripture, but he looked at my life and at least the question was there, are you living according to the way that you're preaching and teaching? And I have never forgotten that. That's always been a challenge. I know the teacher will be judged with greater strictness. So be very, very careful what you teach. But how you live as you teach as well. And so that is an ongoing challenge. I'm always humbled by that as I stand before you Sunday after Sunday. Is there anything in my life that would radically disqualify what I say by how I live? And I guess I need feedback on that. Because if that is the case, I need to know so I can deal with it. 
But I want to make sure that I live, as Paul said to Titus, that I live consistently with that which I preach and teach. Verses 9 and 10, he talks about uh, slaves, which we might say would be the same as employees today. And uh, those who are employees are, are called upon to appeal through the lifestyle they live by not trying to undermine the authority of their boss, by not uh, arguing with their boss, or by actively stealing from them. And I suppose that's a great temptation to take that, especially those that might work in a factory job. I was thinking about an old country song. I, sometimes my mind goes in weird directions as I study scripture in preparation for Sunday. But an old country song that was entitled, One Piece at a Time. Maybe you heard that, huh? Yeah, I think it was a Johnny Cash song, actually. But some of the words would go like this. Here's a man that worked on a car assembly line. He said, one day I devised myself a plan. I'd sneak it out there in my lunchbox in my hand. I'd get it one piece at a time, and it wouldn't cost me a dime. So the ambition was, they're not going to miss a few little parts on the assembly line. If I take one piece at a time every day, by the time I retire, I'll have this car. Well, that's exactly the kind of thing that uh, Paul is warning Titus about. Don't be stealing from your boss. Verses 11 to 14. For the grace of God has appeared bringing salvation to all men, instructing us to deny ungodliness and worldly desires and to live sensibly, righteously, and godly in the present age, looking for the blessed hope and appearing of the glory of our great God and Savior, Jesus Christ, who gave Himself for us to redeem us from every lawless deed and to purify for Himself a people for His own possession, zealous for good deeds. With what I said about this being a post-Christian era, there are, I, I don't believe there are any other verses that are more important for us in this age than these verses that we've just looked at. Because again, the skeptics that are turning away from Scripture, the authority of Scripture, at least they're going to pay a lot of attention if we take to heart what is described in these verses. The grace of God has appeared, bringing salvation to all men. It is designed, according to verse 13, to be, or excuse me, verse 12, to be instructing us, to be teaching us to live in a particular way such that we deny the ungodliness, the desires of this world, teaching us and training us to live sensibly, righteously, and godly in the present age. That's what God's grace ought to be doing in our lives. It ought to be our teacher. So if we savor and value the grace of God given to us through Jesus Christ, if we value that, we are taken to school by grace. We're being instructed in a certain lifestyle, again, a lifestyle that may well appeal to those skeptical of the Bible itself. And so God's grace must be training us. Verse 11, according to the message paraphrase that many of you use, says this. We're being shown how to turn our backs on a godless, indulgent life and how to take on a God-filled, God-honoring life. Again, God's grace should be instructing us in lifestyle. A lifestyle consistent with the truth of the Bible. Thinking about back when I worked a factory job out of high school before I went to college. I had a particular supervisor who was known as a church deacon. He was known as Mr. Churchman around the factory. And uh, he was always going around talking about his church, handing out tracts. But there was another side to this man, not so pleasant. This was a man who was pretty much despised by the other workers. He was hard-hearted. He was manipulative. They literally despised the man. His lifestyle did very little to validate or appeal to the grace of God. Apparently, he was not learning the lessons of what Paul describes here. That those kinds of things never be said of us. That we live a life that is appealing, that is consistent, so that no accusation by the enemy or by anyone else could be made toward us. Again, God's grace must train us to turn our backs, as the paraphrase says, on a godless, indulgent lifestyle. And I wonder, if someone met us who knew nothing about us whatsoever, would our lifestyle alone quickly tell them that we are a believer? Would they reach that conclusion right away if they knew nothing about us? Would they see evidence in our lives that we march to a different drumbeat, that we have different priorities and perspectives? And does the grace training that we are receiving in our lives, does it exhibit also a hope expectation? Because I really love that part there about looking for the blessed hope, verse 13, and the appearing of the glory of our great God and His Savior, Christ Jesus. 
looking for, longing for the blessed hope. I was thinking about a pastor that I knew that in the bulletin, in the newsletter that he would send out, listing the, the calendar of events, the last thing under the events was the return of Christ. Are you ready? And uh, that spoke to me. And maybe that ought to be on our calendar of events because it is a date. We don't know what the date is, but we live in expectation that Christ will come back. And so the big question is, am I expecting that? Am I ready for that to take place? Going back to my teenage years, I was thinking about a song that became popular called I Wish We'd All Been Ready by a guy named uh, uh, Larry Norman. And some of the words of the song went, Life was filled with guns and war, and all of us got trampled on the floor. Children die, the, dr the days grow cold, a piece of bread could buy a bag of gold. I wish we'd all been ready. There are challenging times coming into the world today. We wonder what's next. We're concerned about the election. We're concerned about a lot of things, hot spots in the world, in the Middle East, and so forth. Are we ready for the return of Christ? Are we ready for the challenges that will come in the end days? Again, it's important to live the lifestyle that is consistent with the teachings of Scripture. We need to take lifestyle seriously. There's a, a, a belief in some churches that once you're saved, you're always saved. And I think that's kind of a dangerous teaching. That once you got your ticket punched, it doesn't matter how you live your life. You're going to be in the kingdom no matter what. I'm not to say we shouldn't have a certain confidence as we expect the return of Christ, but to go the other direction is dangerous. So I made a decision, I got baptized, but how I live my life doesn't matter anymore. I'm still going to be in the kingdom when Christ returns. Well, we can have confidence, but we also need to take lifestyle seriously. Verses like 2 Peter chapter 1, verse 10 speak to me, and I hope to you as well. Be all the more eager to make your call and election firm, for in doing so you will never stumble. Again, a lifestyle that is appealing, a lifestyle that is consistent, a lifestyle that gives confidence for the day of Christ. The kind of lifestyle that we live involves several things. It involves living what we might call a forgiving lifestyle. As we prepare for the return of Christ, we are known as a forgiving people. Jesus says in Matthew 6, verses 14 and 15, If you forgive others their transgressions, your heavenly Father will forgive you. But if you do not forgive others... Neither will your Father forgive your transgressions. I need to be quick and ready to forgive others. If I want my Father to forgive me through Christ, again, so that I can have confidence on the day of His return. A lifestyle that anticipates the return of Christ is a confessing lifestyle. Romans chapter 2, verses 5 and 6. By your stubbornness and impenitent heart, you are storing up wrath for yourself for the day of wrath and revelation of the just judgment of God who will repay everyone according to His works. Sobering passage, I hope, that would not apply to any of us. But if we dare be stubborn and unrepentant, it is a fearful thing. And so we want to make sure that we are confessing our sins as we ought to. 1 John chapter 1, verses 8 and 9. If we say that we are without sin, we deceive ourselves, and the truth is not in us. But if we acknowledge our sins, He is faithful and just and will forgive our sins and cleanse us from every wrongdoing. Keeping those things in mind as we anticipate the return of Christ, verse 14 describes Him as the one who gave Himself for us to redeem us from every lawless deed and to purify for Himself a people for His own possession, zealous for good works. We ought to be about those things because the Christ that we serve who's coming back is about those things as well. He has given Himself for us to pay the price we could never pay, to redeem us from all the lawless deeds that we could get caught up in, to purify for Himself a people who are zealous for good deeds. That's the kind of character that He's trying to perfect in our lives. Again, in all these verses that we've looked at here this morning and what Paul writes to Titus, character is the issue. It has always been the issue, but again, it is never more important than it is in this particular time that we live in. And so if we are going to reach out to those who are skeptical, if we're going to reach out to those nuns, those who are post-Christian individuals, the way that we live is probably going to have the greatest impact. I know that I stand before a group of believers that take those things seriously. I'm confident of that. But there is an urgency for us to continue to take those things seriously. And again, that we might teach and reach others by the lifestyle that we live.